Happy Hispanic Heritage Month and welcome to our Hispanic Heritage Month special. I'm Andy Justice. And I'm Laurie Farrell. Hispanic Heritage Month is September 15th through October 15th, a time to celebrate histories, cultures, and contributions of American citizens whose ancestors came from Hispanic heritage. Western movies, cowboys, and Western culture are all things that many actually associate with Texas. Yeah, and this may be a big part of Texan culture, but it's first, it first began with the Vaqueros. KMR Local 4's Princess Bryant has more. The lasso, chaps, and cowboys is what comes to many people's mind when they think about Texas. Although this is a huge part of Texan culture, it first began with the Vicaros. Started uh, when really the Spanish came over to Mexico and to Texas and uh, the uh, southwest of, of the U.S. Um, and it was really just a tradition of um, uh, the Spanish brought over horsemanship and and so they taught it to uh, the Spaniards they brought with them, to the Mexicans they encountered, to native peoples they encountered. Over time, because of the vaqueros, the horse meant a lot to the Spaniards that brought it over and in Mexico. The Mexican example in the early col colonial period was someone who herded horses, right? And then over time in Mexico itself, during the colonial period, you start to see different names that are used. So you go from you know, the vaquero to the ranchero, right? Which is kind of a sort of a similar meaning. So a person who works with horses in a hacienda, which is like a large kind of landed estate. In the 1940s through the 1960s, Western movies began to get popular and show to people across the country what cowboy culture looks like. Look at all the great Westerns of the 1950s, you know, with John Wayne and all those, you know, classic American films. I mean, these were all English-speaking Anglo men who were engaging in these cattle drives um, and, and things like that. TV shows and movies started, you know, romanticizing the American West and the cowboys, and then it became uh, what, you know, the white Anglo person was the cowboy, not the vaquero, and you start seeing the Spanish people become secondary characters, or they become, you know, get typecast as the villain. Bowman says that people should know the history and culture behind the cowboy and where it actually all began. Culture and individuals are more a result of multiplicity than anything else, right? And, you know, I mean, in this case, um, vaqueros and tejanos and Mexican Americans are very much, or as much a part of American history as, you know, English speaking people or anyone else. In Amarillo, Princess Bryant, KMR Local 4 News. If you'd like to see the full interviews and to hear more about the Vaquero history, head over to our website. That is myhighplains.com. Today, the Barrio neighborhood is 87% Hispanic. That according to the Barrio Neighborhood Planning Committee President, Teresa Kennedy. And back in 1930, an elementary school was built to accommodate the Hispanic students of the Barrio neighborhood. Jack Kessler tells us about the history of Dwight Morrow Elementary School. And in the Barrio neighborhood, there were, they were one of four schools. There was Glenwood in 1921, Sanborn in 1922, Our Lady of Guadalupe was a parochial school in 1928, and then Dwight Morrow was built in 1930. And in this school, it served our Mexican kids. And the Barrio neighborhood is where a lot of the Mexican people lived because they worked at the railroad and were brought in to work at the railroad as well. From 1930 to 1965, Dwight Morrow Elementary School served only Hispanic students. Betty Solis, whose career in education began at the school as a first grade teacher, taught there until its closing. When I went, it was already a nice building, a nice brick school. We had six classrooms, um, first grade through sixth grade. We didn't have kindergarten, you know, back then. My husband, even went to Dwight Morrow when he was a child. And back then, you know, it's right in the middle of the barrio. And they called it the Mexican school. So when they told me I was going to the Mexican school, you know, that was fine because coming from Argentina, I was used to Spanish and speaking Spanish. The school was named after Dwight Morrow, who, according to the Encyclopedia Britannica, was appointed by President Calvin Coolidge in 1927 as the ambassador to Mexico. In 1965, Dwight Morrow Elementary School was closed. They built the expressway right through our community, which took away a lot of houses and a lot of our students. So our enrollment fell down to 
under 200, so that's why they had to close it. According to Amaral Independent School District and William Henry, it was estimated the school district could save $16,000 by closing the school and splitting the estimated 196 students that were enrolled between Sanborn and Glenwood Elementary. Gl Glenwood was a real good experience to, you know, I know some people said, well, here comes Ms. McQuirk and all the Mexicans. But, you know, we were a smaller group going to Glenwood than those going to Sanborn. Glenwood was more Anglo, uh, Sanborn was a mixed. I stayed at Glenwood then 42 years, so I guess I liked it. <laughs> the building that was once the elementary school is now the Region 16 Education Service Center, Head Start Cleveland Street Center. What I love about this school and, and now Region 16 Head Start is it was all about the kids. That's how they came together was to serve our kids and they continue to do that. And uh, it's just nice to know it's still serving children who need. Preschool is so important. Um, we, didn't, we didn't have preschool, we had first graders. But uh, it's just nice to see it being used and, you know, and it, we th I mean, it was, we were proud of our building, you know, we were proud of being at Dwight Morrow. According to AISD and William Henry, the 56th legislature of 1960 authorized preschool programs for non-English speaking children. And the first class approved for Emerald Public School was a summer program in 1960 at Dwight Murrow with Solis as the teacher. That program would continue through 1965 and I do want to add this. Mrs. Solis is a local legend and the fact that we got to sit down and talk with her about her experiences, mm -hmm. we felt truly blessed, no doubt about that. That's Milestone awesome. birthdays, right? In some cultures, it's that sweet 16. In the Hispanic culture, the party happens a year before with an important meaning. Cambio de zapatillas, so that is you leaving the, your little childhood and now you're able to wear zapatillas like heels. Every girl has that special dream of being able to be a princess for one night. And for many young Hispanic girls, that dream comes true with their quinceanera. KMR Local Force Princess Brian brings us more on the history of quinceaneras and what they represent. Take a look. Of course, it's like a special moment every girl wished for in a big dress. You know, I've, the whole day is about you. But I also wanted to have it because, you know, I love my family and friends and it was just one day we could all come together and just celebrate growing up and becoming a young woman. Quinceañeras was a tradition that began with Aztecs and Mayans and was celebrated in regions of Mexico and Guatemala. Quince, meaning 15 in Spanish, the Mayans and Aztecs saw this age as something to be celebrated for girls to show the transition from a girl to a young woman. Back in the day, the Mayans and Aztecs, it was like 15, okay, you reach your puberty point, you know, and you are no longer a little girl, so now you are becoming a woman. So we have to do something symbolic to let everybody know and to introduce you to society that you are ready to become a woman. When the Spanish conquered the Aztec and Mayan lands in the early 1500s, the Quinceañeras began to change, now including a Catholic mass and blessing by a priest. Now you have the mass celebrations and after that the, the parties. But the main focus of a little girl entering into womanhood, it has stayed there since the beginning of, of times. Mainly, you're packed with God. You're saying thank you to Him. Um, you are doing your promise with Him. The night of the special day is big for many young girls, but before the party, there are many symbolic moments like the changing of the shoes. Cambio de zapatillas, so that is you leaving the, your little child and now you're able to wear zapatillas, like heels, stilettos. I had my stepdad and my uncle do my shoes because I wanted to do two men that are in my life that have showed me very important thinking about having a man in your life, so they did do my shoes. Another symbolic part of the night is when the special girl gives away a doll or bear to show that she's giving up her child era and becoming a young woman. La, la muñeca. So basically, you can actually do a little doll or you can toss like a little rose or flower or something and mainly you get all the little girls called up to the to the dance floor and everything and then whoever catches whoever ca catches the 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 flower or the doll gets to have that muñeca. My doll I gave it to my little cousin I'm turning into a young lady and she's still a little girl so I'm having it to show her like it's going to be your turn next to being a young lady and this is how I want you to like follow and 
go by. A rich history and culture that has changed over the years, but the meaning behind it stays constant for many generations. I myself have daughters, so I am passing on those same traditions because it's something to be proud of. It's a beautiful and colorful culture, and it's something that should just be be continued, like not let it fade away. I want them to forget their roots. They are born here in the U.S., but I don't want them to forget where they come from, where their family comes from, and their, and their roots, and just bring them here where we are in Amarillo. In Amarillo, Princess Ryan, KMR Local 4 News. I want you guys to take a look at this. We found this. This was from your quinceanera. Yes. Um, tell us a little bit about your experience with it, Mari. Um, it, I was just so blessed to even have a quinceanera. Um, my mom, she made us herself a promise because she never was able to have her own quinceanera. Yeah. Uh, her family couldn't afford one. Also, she had like nine other siblings as yeah. well. And she told herself, you know what? I will give my, my daughters, all three of them, a quinceanera. And she sure did. She threw myself, she threw a one for me, she threw one for my sister Karen and Jackie. And we just, I, looking through all this video and the pictures, it just gets me so excited. I just can't wait for my own daughter too. Oh, I'm, I'm planning exciting. on continuing this tradition and you know, just stick to my roots and just pass that down. I love that. I do want to uh, just take a moment here. Meteorologist Maria Pacias also celebrated her quinceanera and said, it meant a lot to her and her sisters as well. She says it was a big effort to put on uh, that was put on by her parents, and they did it four times. Maria said that she believes her parents always wanted them to remember religion is the backbone of their lives, even when celebrating a milestone birthday. So glad we got to share that with you. You know, food, it plays a big role at almost all Hispanic gatherings, quinceañeras included. Of course, and there is a food staple you'll see quite often. According to food historians, the first tortilla was invented by a Mayan peasant for his hungry king. It's been a while, I don't know, 10,000 BC oh, or so. Goodness. And today, tortillas remain one of the most popular bread products in the global market and are the foundation of many Mexican dishes. And KMR Local 4's Kaylee Hanna stopped by a local tortilla business to learn more about the art of tortilla making. Tortilleria Gomez has been providing the Dumas community with handmade tortillas since 1996. That goes back to our dad, right? You know, he yeah. came from Mexico and he worked for another local tortilla factory in Dumas. And then I think from there that kind of inspired him to do his own thing and kind of branch off. The history, I guess, behind our business yep. kind of developed his, his uh, dream and his goal from there to do his own thing and being a business owner himself. So Tortilleria Gomez has recently expanded to the Amarillo area and sisters Rosario Ortega and Angelica Gonzalez are taking over the family business. It takes a team to run a tortilla factory. You've got so many different people playing so many different parts and so many different things that need to get taken care of and it's a crazy beautiful experience. It's um, something our dad worked very hard for and we don't want to see just kind of die out. And go. We want to be here to continue his legacy and keep growing and keep expanding and Keep his dream alive, which has now become our dream, I feel like, and yes. our, our goals. Currently, the United States is home to a tortilla industry worth $6 billion, which includes taco shells, tostada shells, chips, corn, and flour tortillas. According to Ortega, there's a high demand for tortillas in West Texas. It's growing. Um, it's continuing to grow because I feel like there's just, you know, the Hispanic community is growing exponentially over these years. I think it's going to continue to increase and uh, the demand for tortillas are just going to keep going, keep going up. I don't feel that it's just the Hispanics that are in the demand for tortillas. I think it's for anybody and everybody that, you know, enjoys the tortilla, that wants to have that breakfast burrito. Really, I mean, it's, it's a demand with everyone. And no matter what your preference is, tortillas can be used in more ways than you can imagine. A big part of a tortilla that people don't think about, they think about the taco, they think about the burrito. It's, it's a utensil. It's not just for your burrito and your taco. It's a, it can be a utensil. In Amarillo, Kaylee Hanna, KMR Local 4 News. Ortega says Hispanic food has become a staple in Texas and people are wanting to incorporate Mexican dishes into their meals at home. And for a list of locations of where to find Tortilleria Gomez's tortillas, go to myhighplains.com. And now we got a special treat. Um, so the, the good people over there at the Tortilleria did us a little favor. They taught us how to make the perfect tortilla. Take a look. Tortillas are a staple in Hispanic culture. It's a comfort food for the Mexican culture. It's, mm -hmm. it's something that we have 
pretty much for every meal, you know, breakfast, lunch, dinner. Whether it be flour tortilla or corn tortilla, there's always one of those incorporated into the meals. In the mid-20th century, tortilla lovers revolutionized the process of making the famous flatbread using machines instead of hands. Using these specialized machines, people were able to make over 60,000 tortillas in an hour. Tortillas are made with simple ingredients, flour, salt, baking powder, hot water, and a neutral flavored oil or fat. After you uh, mix all of the ingredients together, you are going to let your dough rest um, anywhere from 30 to 45 minutes. It really just depends on how big of a dough ball that you're producing, how big of a tortilla that you're wanting. We have, you know, what we call pressers and they press the dough ball and that's what gives you that round tortilla. Now I know if you're doing it at home, a lot of people don't have pressers, um, so they're rolling them out by hand. And then from there it gets transferred over to a grill and they're cooked. And as for Gonzalez and Ortega's favorite way to use a tortilla. I'm a taco girl. I, I know people like flour tortillas with their tacos and some people like corn tortillas. I can do either or. It just depends on the mood. But I'm, I'm a taco girl. I just love a quesadilla. That's my favorite go-to <laughs> snack. I'm just cheese and a tortilla. You're good to go. I'm happy. In Amarillo, Kaylee Hanna, KMR Local 4 News. Hey, I got to tell you, I agree. Like uh, a tortilla and cheese don't need much more than that. According mm -hmm. to Gonzalez, by the way, the first half of the Tortilleria Gomez crew preps the dough starting around 4 or 5 in the morning. Then the second half of the crew comes in to cook, package, and ship out the tortillas. Oh, wow. And yeah. if you are interested in learning how to make your own tortillas, we have a tortilla recipe waiting for you at myhighplains.com. Okay, so... Um, I've always wanted to do this. So there's a recipe, of course, that you can do this. Yes. You're going to do it kind of the, the easier way. We've yes. got a tortilla press, and then I'm just going to kind of try to work this out a little bit. Um, yours is probably going to be a lot faster than mine. Oh, yeah, definitely. I am so excited. When, when you go home, does, uh, does your family make these by scratch? Um, sometimes we do. Uh, my mom usually uses what I'm using right now, a tortilla press. Mm -hmm. she, it makes it easy. You've got a little so parchment easy. paper. It's so easy. Because you're doing it the hard way, for sure. Well, I feel like my mom now. Wow, look at this. You press it. And there's nothing better. I was just having this conversation. I was getting my hair cut today, and I was having a conversation with the ladies uh, in the barbershop, and I uh -huh. was talking about how much I love, like, there's nothing better than, a, like, a fresh-made tortilla. There's yes. nothing, nothing better. Oh, they're so good. Um, I don't know it. what I'm going to do with this once I actually get it. Done. I don't think we're going to be baking. Cheryl, are we baking Ooh. these? What are we going to do with these? Nope. No, we're not baking them. It's okay. How did yours... It came out okay. I mean, I had help, though, and I, Here, I gonna, feel like... I'm going to see what like... happens if I put mine in. Now, Go just, for it. And then we also have a comal here that Cheryl gave us. And that's what it's cooked on. That's, yes. That's what it happens from here. And you would... I will clean this up, I promise. But that's how you kind of put it. I wonder it. if it's... Uh, is it then, thinner, the better, I guess, maybe? Uh, um... Oh, yeah, that looks good, Andy. Listen, I did all right. That looks pretty good. Listen, I'm not going to quit my, <laughs> yeah. my day job, but um, it's a lot of fun. Yeah, it's, it really is. This, is. this is so fun. I'm glad we got to do this. And also, whenever you're cooking them, you never want to use, like, uh, you know, like a spatula or, or tongs or anything. You want to use your bare hands whenever really? you're making these. My mom always said, you're ready to get married whenever you use your hands and flip the tortilla. Hey, on the we need to have a segment with your mom just sharing with us some wisdom. I feel like there's a lot of wisdom oh, yes, hanging sure. out in Fargo for sure. One place where tortillas are plenty is the annual Fajita Festival hosted by the Emerald Hispanic Chamber of Commerce. Cook teams spend hours making those fajitas. This year, the event was over at Hodgetown. Those who attended got music, fun, and all the fajitas they could handle. Happening close to Cinco de Mayo was also a chance to celebrate Hispanic culture. I think the more we get involved with our community, the better we, you know, do as a city. Um, Amarillo is growing nonstop. We have a lot of out-of-town visitors. So if we reinvest in us, no one's going to take our culture of Amarillo away. Well said. Officials say the annual event gives organizations the chance to serve the Amarillo area while raising funds for Hispanic Chamber scholarships and internship programs and operations. So... Make sure that you look for that event again next spring. They are there during your most tragic moments, and it's important that a funeral director understands you and your family's needs. Earlier this year, Lighthouse Funeral Home announced the addition of Patricia Garcia. Garcia is Emerald's first female funeral director who speaks both English and Spanish. 
Leaders there say more than a third of Emerald's population is Hispanic and having someone to communicate with in your native language during one of the most sensitive times in a family's life is critical to easing the burden and removing confusion around the funeral process. It's important for the Hispanic community to know that we're here. Honestly, a lot of the Hispanic community don't even know we're here. So it's always a treat when I know that we have touched and reached a new family in the community. Lighthouse Funeral Home is family owned and operated. Boxing, MMA and other types of competitive fighting are a significant part of Hispanic culture. And whether it be for national pride, a path for a better life, family tradition, and more, Amro is building up a number of athletes. Rochelle Hamilton Jr. introduces us to one. For amateur boxer Nadia Moreno, it's part of the lifestyle. Stepping into the ring is her true passion. She's been boxing for about three years now, and her main goal turning pro by the end of the year. I've always visioned myself getting to the top, so. I'm just going to keep working until I get there. I want to be able to, of course, take care of my family, my team, everybody that's been there behind me since day one. Moreno's fighting career was actually born in high school as a wrestler and evolved into combat sports. Got out of high school, uh, started doing jujitsu, um, and I did really well in that. I won. I, I did well, so they were like, you know what, maybe you should try MMA. And I was like, I think I want to try it. Like, I just want to go for it. And then just things just opened up in my eyes. Prepping for a fight isn't easy. Grueling workouts, sparring sessions, weightlifting, and just as important, how you fuel your body. What I found that works best for me is staying off the breads, no fried foods, just natural, organic, try to eat organic, just chicken, um, white meat, and veggies. Um, and I make a lot of teas and like sugar-free drinks. I try to keep it fun. And sometimes, sometimes I have days where I'm like, I'm not up for it, but I see my teammates in here working hard and everything. And I'm like, you know what, I can't, I gotta, I gotta put in too. Moreno tells me the biggest supporter on her team, her fiance and coach, Israel Rodriguez. Our conversations are always a about boxing and MMA and we're at home in the living room going through moves late at night, early in the morning, like we're always putting each other through challenges. Staying ready so she doesn't have to get ready. In Amarillo, Rochelle Hamilton Jr., KMR, Local 4 News. Amarillo is really making a name of itself when it comes to boxing, MMA, and similar sports. Yeah, in fact, we're sending competitors to local events statewide and even to some national and international competitions, which those stories we've covered in the past are over on our website, myhighplains.com. Listen, we want to thank you so much for being a part of our Hispanic Heritage Special. We hope that you've enjoyed the stories that we brought you, the uniqueness of the Hispanic culture that, that we have right here in our area. Definitely. I know I had a blast uh, participating in Princess's story and just being included in that and then getting to relive, relive my quinceanera moments, that was just such a blessing. I'm very glad she reached out. Well, thanks for tuning in. Again, myhighplanes.com if you're looking for more.